I, I invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 9, verse 32 through 35. Acts chapter 9, verse 32 through 35. If there are any guests in the house, uh, we've been studying the book of Acts for several months, and now we're in the process of going through chapter 9. Reading from the New King James Bible. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came uh, down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt at Leda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. During a Sunday morning service, Four masked men came into the sanctuary with assault rifles and started screaming at the pastor and the members. If you deny your faith, you can leave the sanctuary in safety. Leave now. Silence hovered over the church. Eventually, one by one, members started to stand up and made their way towards the exit. And the gunman said, I'll give you one more chance. Deny your faith, and I'll let you go safely. Go now. Some of the members were crying. Others were sobbing. Others were praying. Still more were looking at the cross of Christ with tears in their eyes. They were ready to face the consequences. And the gunman said one more time, nobody can leave. But then all of a sudden, the gunman lowered their guns and gave one last command to the preacher. Preach on, preacher. These are the real members in your church. Stunned. The members that were left looked around the room at all the empty seats. Is your commitment to Christ based on an actual commitment or is it based on contentment? In this passage of scripture, Luke, the author of the book of Acts, now turns his focus to the ministry of Peter. And um, Peter, while his faith uh, in Christ uh, uh, diminished from time to time in the Gospels, as we watch him in the book of Acts, his faith and commitment in Christ is growing more and more. And... um, And so we see uh, that his life uh, dominates the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 13 through 28, the Apostle Paul dominates uh, those chapters. Uh, And and the Apostle uh, Peter's life is, um, is becoming more and more Uh, dominant. He's becoming more committed to the Lord. And we, uh, if you notice, Jesus gave the apostle Peter a special assignment. He was given the opportunity to um, open the door of the kingdom of heaven to all people. Remember in Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 20, when Peter declared that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, And I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, your confession of faith, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. 
and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> now we know that keys are used to open a door. And so we see in the book of Acts that God gave Peter the privilege of opening the kingdom of God to the Jews in Acts chapter 2, to the Samaritan, the half-Jew, half-Gentile in Acts chapter 8, and he's going to open the kingdom of God to the, Jew, to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. So, Peter is now between Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 10. So let's take a look at his personal ministry. Point number one, Peter, a, di a, a disciple committed to the Lord's commission. Peter, a disciple committed to the Lord's commission. That's verse 32. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. Peter went on a mission that took him all over Israel, not outside of Israel, within Israel. He preached in Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. And he was just following the Lord's commission to go and preach the gospel and make disciples. And God chose Peter to be the leader of the church and the apostle to the Jews. In, in Galatians 2.8, the apostle Paul says, For God who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, that is the Jew, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. Therefore, it was Peter's responsibility to preach the gospel uh, to the unbelieving Jew and to strengthen and encourage the believing Jews wherever they were. And so he set out on a mission, an evangelistic uh, tour to visit and strengthen all the Jewish preachers, all the Jewish believers. Now it says here, and... He also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. In Lydda. How was the church established in Lydda? It's unclear. The scripture doesn't mention it. It may have been established by the Jewish believers when they were in Jerusalem uh, attending Pentecost. Or it, uh, Lydda might have been established by the Jewish believer, believers during the time of persecution in Acts chapter 8. Nevertheless, the, in the city there were saints. And uh, in Acts chapter 9 verse 13, Ananias was the very first one to use the word saint to refer to the Lord's people. And he did that during a prayer to the Lord. So the word saint means in Greek, hagios, and refers to uh, the sanctified or the holy ones. It simply means to set apart, to be separated. And all God's people are saints, set apart to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to know him and to make him known. And we also read that a city that has believers within it is highly blessed. Now, the citizens living in the city may not know it, but it's true. Why is that? The believers bring the presence of God into the city. And so they bring with them the presence of righteousness, of morality, of justice, of love, joy, and peace. They bring hope of eternal life, ministry to the poor, to the uneducated, and to the diseased. Proverbs 11.11 11 says, through the blessing of the upright, a city is established. 
but by the mouth of the wicked it is destroyed. Likewise, Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. The point is this. It is the duty of all believers today to witness and share Christ um, within your um, circle of family and friends. And this is regardless of your spiritual gift. We are all commanded uh, to preach the gospel and to make disciples. And, and this means that uh, for us, uh, we need to share the gospel with our family, with our neighbors, with our co-workers, and even with strangers. So when you go out and about, remember to invite someone to church at Calvary. Carry gospel tracts. Hand them out. If you're afraid to hand them out personally, then leave them where somebody may be able to read it, whether it's at a restaurant or the bathroom or maybe next to the People magazine before the checkout counter. People are just waiting in line. They're looking for something to do. But share the gospel with somebody. Testify to what Jesus has done for you. And I guarantee you, as you lead others to Christ, they will be the crown in which you will glory forever and ever. And they will be thanking you for all eternity that you reached out to them and opened the door of the kingdom of God. Number two, the need, a tragic sickness. The need, a tragic sickness. That's verses 33 and 34. Let's read it together. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. Peter finds a man who's been paralyzed for eight years. And other than his name and his condition, we know very little about him. Uh, he may have been a believer. Um, we read in verse 32 that Jesus went to visit the saints in Leda. So he may have been a saint. He may have been an unbeliever. But what we know is not only was Peter... Uh, going into Leda uh, to strengthen the saints that was there, but he was also there to preach the gospel uh, to all who would listen. And so um, this man may have been either a believer or an unbeliever. We also know that Peter took no credit for healing Aeneas. He healed him in the name of Jesus. Uh, he didn't promote himself. I remember 15 years ago, there was a bus that ran through Waldorf, and it read, The Top Gun of Deliverance. I don't remember the guy's name, but he was promoting himself. The Top Gun of Deliverance. I don't think he was the top gun. If anyone was, it was Paul and Peter. In fact, Paul and Peter accomplished the same miracles if you read the book of Acts. But Peter did not promote himself. He promoted the Lord Jesus Christ. And we too have to point others to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is he and he alone who heals us. Notice Peter said two things. He said to the man to stand because Jesus was making him whole. And he was able to stand because he had faith in Jesus Christ. If he had no faith in Christ, he could not stand. He was disabled. He was a paralytic. And two, he told the man to make his bed. Why do we make our beds when we get up in the morning? My wife makes our bed every morning. I don't understand it. It seems like a waste of time and energy to me. <laughs> it 
you know, because in 15 hours, I'm going to be right back in bed. But she sees it differently. She makes the bed every day. Um, she likes our house to be clean and orderly. And in her mind, when we're finished sleeping, we no longer need our bed. And so she makes it. In eight years, Aeneas was bed stricken. And that meant his friends and his family had to attend to him. They had to care for him. Uh, they had to wash him. They had to roll him over so that he wouldn't get any bed sores. And they had to make his bed. But when Jesus healed him, the man no longer needed a bed as a permanent dwelling place because the Lord had healed him physically and spiritually. Now we know that God still heals people today of their physical disabilities. And we also know that God heals people today of their spiritual deadness. Now, spiritual healing takes place in three phases. Salvation, sanctification, glorification. Salvation is a one-time event in a person's life when God saves us from the penalty of sin. And this happens when we repent of our sins and place our trust in Christ alone for salvation. God saves us. He saves us from sin, death, and hell. And then after that, he begins to sanctify us, and that's a process. And he, he saves us from the power of sin, and this is a lifelong journey. And no two believers are, go through the sanctification process the exact same way. We all, have, we all are carrying different baggage when we become a Christian, for one Christian, uh, he may overcome uh, a, a specific sin like lying in a month. Another Christian, it may take him 10 years to overcome that sin by the power of God. And so we are all growing spiritually at a different rate. And this is why as a church, we need to be patient and loving towards each other because we are all growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ together. Amen. Amen. And God is growing us from spiritual infancy to maturity, from brokenness to wholeness. And we look forward one day to going to heaven where we will experience glorification. And this will happen one second after we die. And at that moment, we will be saved from the presence of sin. Never again will we be tempted to sin against God. Never again will we be uh, challenged and ravaged by the sins uh, that are around us. Uh, God will take away the presence of sin for all eternity. And Aeneas experienced just a touch of this wholeness. Peter said, Jesus the Messiah makes you whole. So whatever your condition today is, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, he will make you whole. He will transform you so that you can take up your bed and walk. My third and final point is the result. All turn to the Lord. The result. All turn to the Lord. That's verse 35. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now, everyone in Lydda and, and Sharon who saw Peter miraculously heal Aeneas, turn to the Lord. Notice the word saw. It was seeing the power of God demonstrated in this man's life that opened the hearts of people and they turned to the Lord. Jesus said in Luke 10, 24, 
Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it. And they wanted to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Nothing influences people more than the power of Christ being displayed in committed believers. I shared with you that I got saved during a Sunday morning service during an Amway convention, and that was a nine-month process. And when I joined uh, the Amway team, I noticed that there were a few Christians there. And I was observing their life. And I noticed that they openly practiced their faith. They were talking about the Lord. They were thanking God for his successes and for their setbacks. They shared their testimony with me. Uh, and I could see that they genuinely loved one another. But probably one of the most important things I saw was their honesty in their business dealings. Every Sunday I would go to the direct distributor's house to purchase products, uh, to buy tapes on how to run the business and to read books on how to become a better salesman. The direct distributor's garage was filled with products, books, and tapes, and nobody was watching it. And except me, <laughs> I was watching. One salesman after another purchased the products that they selected. No one stole any of the products. And I remembered that. And that opened up my heart to want to know more about God and about Christ. So here's the point. People are watching you whether you like it or not. And whether you know it or not. And they're looking to determine if your faith is genuine or counterfeit. And if it's genuine, does it produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Because that's what they want. And if you're displaying the fruit of the Spirit, you're in a great position to lead people to Christ. In conclusion, the Apostle Peter was faithful and committed to opening the doors of the kingdom of heaven to both the Jew and the Samaritan. And he preached to crowds both large and small. He preached one-on-one. -on -one. And Peter wasn't being selective. He preached to a Jew that was uh, whole physically and to those that were broken physically. Because he knew that they were all broken spiritually and they needed the salvation of the Lord. And Peter wasn't perfect. He made his mistakes. We could read it in the Gospels and we read it in the book of Acts. But he was committed and faithful to God's calling on his life. And God calls us too to be faithful and committed to our calling. And we, God's not looking for perfection in our life. He's not even looking for us to be successful. But he is interested to see if we are faithful. So... Peter doesn't know it, but God's going to test his commitment one more time to see if he will actually share the gospel with the Gentiles. This we're going to discover in the next sermon. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start at Acts 9, verses 36 through 43. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him 
imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. Amen. In 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar successfully besieges Jerusalem and carries off some of the treasures from the temple of God to Babylon. The most valuable pieces of treasure he captures are some young men from the royal family that are ordered to serve him in his royal court. Of these young men is Daniel. The Bible highlights that Daniel and the other captives are 10 times wiser than all the experienced magicians, enchanters in the whole kingdom. Daniel's wisdom is unrivaled and enables him to interpret a terrifying vision from King Nebuchadnezzar's son. And from then on, his legend grows. The gift of wisdom and the anointing on Daniel's life were so revered that he was found to have insight, intelligence, and wisdom like that of the gods. That's in Daniel 5 and 11. But let me pause so I can share this. Culture praises people's gifts. The world is all about look at me and look at what I can do. But what the world needs is anointed people that can use their gifts to usher God into transforming people's lives. Christine Kane said a gift will fill a room, entertain a crowd and stir people up. But the anointing breaks yokes and chains and bondages. Anointed people are those submitted to the will of God and who are rewarded with his favor. I've met another anointed man whose wisdom was sought after, much like Daniel's, and I would like to share his story with you. A few years ago, I had an amazing opportunity to build a relationship with this amazing man of faith that I just alluded to, and God glorified him by this. His relationship continued to grow. And this man had been touched from a very early age. And for me, he was a source of spiritual nourishment. And as I continued to grow in the faith, he was right there ushering me in. One day at lunch, my good friend shared two short stories that I had to share with you all on tonight. When my friend was just 15 years old, the Herod cheerleader at his high school stopped and talked to him at lunch. She told him that her body had been injured and she feared she would never be healed from this infirmity. My friend who was on fire for God prayed for this young lady and believed that God would heal her. A year later, when he came back and, and came to visit, she shared that she was fully here, healed. Excuse me, And she believed that on that faithful day a year or so ago, that God heard her prayers and his prayers and that she, her body had been healed from this infirmity. Another time, the football team came and sat with my friend during lunch. He began to minister, and the Holy Spirit filled that place. The next moment, all he knew was that he was standing up on the table and preaching and proclaiming the goodness of God. The preacher, the, excuse me, the principal came in and saw what was happening, but he didn't say anything. He just watched from afar and just gazed. The principal actually waited for the session to end. And after my friend was done, he called him into his office. My friend was like, oh, gosh, I'm in trouble now. But this is what the principal said. The principal said, I don't mind you sharing your faith. But when you turn the cafeteria into a cathedral, that's an issue. <laughs> so as you see, my friend from a very early age learned how to use not only his gift, but he actually learned to walk in the calling that God had on his life. And my friend's ministry continued to flourish for years as it does on today. 
In our text, we observe Peter operating in the same power and authority that he saw Jesus display when he walked on earth. However, this time the Holy Spirit is the one who is assisting Peter in his new role. We know this because Jesus said, I will send you the helper from the Father. The helper is the spirit of truth who comes from the Father that is found in John chapter 15, verse 26. It's ironic that the same miracles, signs, and wonders that Peter once saw his Lord and Savior perform, he's now doing. But how is it possible? How is it possible that Peter is able to do the same thing? It's possible because of the intimate relationship that Jesus had with the Father. And the same intimate relationship Peter actually shared with Jesus. In John 14, verses 12 through 14, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will you do. Because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You should be clapping on today knowing that whatever we do in the Father, whatever we do through the Son's name, the Father will glorify and bless. That's powerful all in itself. I don't know about you, but I love when I hear greater works these you will do. Greater works than Jesus Christ? Greater works than turning water into wine? Than raising Lazarus from the dead? Than healing those that were blind? Greater works. That's a promise that the power and authority that Christ had, I now have. There's got to be a boldness to believe that I can do what Christ has done. Because the Holy Spirit resides in me. But you only get that by knowing who God is, who Christ is. Maybe that's why some of us are scared to declare how good Jesus is to us. Maybe that's why some of us are so scared to be able to worship on Sunday. Listen, I will come in here and I will praise God's name no matter who's sitting in these chairs. I don't care who's standing up here because I know what God did for me. I will. Oh, Lord, have mercy. (laughs) I'm going to tell you right now. I don't care who's in the midst because I know God is here as long as two or three are gathered. And I will give thanks for what he's done in my life. You can sit here and act like you don't know him, but I'm not going to do the same thing. Because if you're bold enough to stand up and clap on a Sunday for the Ravens or the Redskins, how dare you not come in here and show glory to God Almighty? Let me get back to my word. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me get back to the word. I'm sorry. Jesus. When Jesus came to earth, he came to not only save us from our sins, but in John 10, 10, we learned that he also came that we might experience life more abundantly, more abundantly. The New Living Translation says it like this. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Let me sow this into your spirit. The gospel of the kingdom of God not only gives us the assurance of salvation through Jesus Christ and the promise of eternal life, eternal life. It is also God's radical plan to change our lives here and now. Not when we get into heaven, but while we're here on this earth, we can tap into the promises of God. It's the Father's way of growing us into mature believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus shows us this also, that we can experience the kingdom of heaven here in the earthly realm, And John the Baptist, he actually emphasizes the same principle in his prophetic declaration when he says, repent for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This kingdom principle is only attainable to those who are closely connected to God spiritually through maturity, which is a result of faithful discipleship. Being a disciple of Christ is more than just learning and following his ways. The key is actually applying these godly concepts to our lives every single day. This is also known as doing God's will. Let me say it like this. Knowing the word of God is not enough. (laughs) It's not enough to be able to quote it. You got to be able to apply it to your life. That's how you're going to get the power and authority. You need an example? Well, you know what? (laughs) I got one for you. After Jesus is baptized by his cousin John, 
he's led off into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible says that while he's in the wilderness, the devil tempts him. In one of those conversations, let me, let, let me just give you a little insight what the devil does. So the devil actually knows the word of God. But the difference is he doesn't apply it to his life. So that's why he doesn't have the same power and authority that we have. That's why he's always trying to get us to sin and to turn from God. This is what the devil says. He said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. (laughs) Jesus has to laugh at this, right? Because if you know Christ, you know he is the word and the truth and the life. And he was the word made flesh. So I'm pretty sure the conversation went a little like this. He said, "Um, Satan, good try. (laughs) But if you know me, then you know I'm the word made flesh. So I know it also says this, to not put your Lord God to the test. So when you're tempted by the devil, you should know that it's more than just knowing the word, but you should be exercising it and applying it to your life every day. And that's how the devil will flee from you. When you can call on that word to be able to be a rock in your salvation in the midst of turmoil. In Matthew 6 and 33, Jesus tells the disciples to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus is teaching them the kingdom of God is not a physical place, but it's a spiritual one. The kingdom of God is a place where God rules. If God rules your heart, then this is where the kingdom of God can be found. In your heart. Let me ask you all a question. Do you see your life through God's eyes or are we looking at him through the worldly perspective? Based on the way you answer your question is how I can tell your spiritual maturity. So every time an event comes up or some trouble in your life, if you're running this way or that way, and you're not actually praying and seeking God, then that really determines or it's a byproduct of your spiritual maturity. Are you confident in knowing that God will deliver you like he has so many times before? Or are you worrying with an anxiety and depression and don't know where you're going to turn? If you're spiritually mature, you should know what your answer is. Now, let's walk with, through scripture with Peter a little bit more closely in verses 36 through 38. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha. That's her Aramaic name, which is translated Dorcas, which is her Greek name. This woman was full of good works. Ooh, let me pause right there. Full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. The Bible highlights her good works and charitable deeds. If you're a Christian and you believe in God and you believe and you know what Christ had did for you, there should be an evidence that you leave behind in this earthly realm. There should be works that you exemplify that are done because your Savior did the same type of works. Can you pray for someone who's going through the midst of turmoil? Can you show your face to those that are sick and shut in? Can you be a willing spirit to help those that are in trouble? Can you get off your high horse long enough to actually show compassion to those that are hurting and and that don't know Christ? Because when it comes down to it, either you know him or you don't. And so for all those that don't know Christ, we have to show a special compassion and love because that's how they will know us. By our love for him. Peter arrives on the scene shortly before or excuse me, after she dies. And look at the expectation of those who he who is um, excuse me, who summoned him. They say, but it happened in those days that she became sick and died when they washed her. 
they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples had heard Peter was there, they sent two men to him. My question to you guys on today was, what was their expectation, though? We know it had to be something out of the ordinary because they probably didn't think that he could raise her from the dead. So their expectation was probably, let's just go ahead and summon Peter, one of, one of Christ's disciples, and maybe he can just pray for the family. Maybe he can pray over the body as she transitions to the Father. But the Holy Spirit, that's why we call it the Acts, right? It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit it has something way more intriguing in mind. Verses 39 through 42, then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought to him the upper room. Brought to him or brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dor Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out. <laughs> Very reminiscent. Very reminiscent. To when Jairus' young daughter was dying or died, he put them all out. He knelt and he prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. It's amazing to me that if you look at the scripture, that Jesus said the exact same thing. When he raised the paralytic man. That paralytic man was the same man who was brought to Christ by the four men that carried him through the roof. Isn't it also amazing that Peter was brought to Dorcas by people that knew her as well? So look at the faith of those that had faith in God. That they would bring the man of God to their friend who was desperately in need or dying. So I question you on today, are you who knows Christ carrying him to those that are dying and, and, and dead in their sins, to those that are hurting, to those that don't know him for themselves as their savior? Are we doing that on today? Because if we are, our lives should be full of good works and charitable deeds. Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may show or they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. That's Matthew 5 and 16. And I wanted to highlight one more other thing that James said. And many of you know James is Jesus's brother. In James chapter 2, verses 21, he said, was not Abraham, our father, the father of faith, Justified by works when he offered up his son on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, my final question. Can you show me your works? And that's just not a question for you guys in the audience. That's a question for me as well. That if you know Christ and he knows you, there should be some evidence. There should be a trail of good deeds that we're doing on behalf to glorify the Father. Before I take my seat, I just want to say this. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you will be rooted and established in love. Through God, the Father, Christ, the Son, and the mighty Holy Spirit. Amen.
will be still. 